We are delighted to have with us here today an expert who has devoted his life to what we have been talking about today, all of today actually. This is Anders Wikman, a Swedish opinion leader and author. He is also co-president of the global think tank Club of Rome, chairman of the governing board of Climate Kick, a public-private partnership at the EU level promoting innovation of a low-carbon society, and a member of the International Resource Panel, a UN-appointed expert body with a goal to steer society away from overconsumption, waste and ecological harm to a more prosperous, sustainable future. Anders has also served as a member of the European Parliament, Assistant Secretary General of the UN and Policy Director of UNDP. Warm welcome to you, Anders Wiekman, here in the studio. And uh, we have asked you to follow the entire broadcast and to give your summary uh, from your extensive background of what's happened here today. So the stage is yours. Well, thank you, Katarina, and, and thank you for inviting me this has been a, a really rich afternoon. So I would like to commend you for having put together speakers and panelists who have really illustrated both the challenges and the opportunities. Um, one thing that I think is important at the outset to remember is that circular economy, even if that is the absolute most urgent way to go now, it's not a panacea, it's not the solution for everything, because there is nothing 100% circular in the technical society. So we have to, we have to be realistic, what can be achieved. Um, and we also know that when you make a system more productive, you free up resources. There is the so-called Jevons paradox or rebound effect. So policymakers must be involved to make sure that those resources that are freed up when we become more circular, are not just used to demand material somewhere else. And then I think it's also important to recognize that consumption patterns are so different in different parts of the world. In the International Resource Panel, we have made an estimate that an average citizen in a country like Sweden has a material footprint of roughly 30 tons per year if you count everything. An African living in the sub-Saharan Africa, the footprint is around two tons. So there is a difference of one to 15. So that illustrates the challenge we have. So I think, yes, going circular, but we have also to realize that we have to reduce or at least limit or control material consumption in the future. Circularity is has to be combined with the recognition that high quality of life is not only about material consumption, it's about so many other things. Another thing I picked up, of course, was the importance of digital technologies. Without them, very little of what has been shown today would be possible. Digital technologies are underpinning this development. So that's absolutely positive. Uh, but there are also risks. Um, the woman who talked about jobs uh, emphasized that digital technologies can help bring about new jobs. Circular economy can do that. But we also see the opposite happening. That digital technologies, AI, robotization, eliminates jobs, make people redundant. So we have to be, we have to be mindful of that. This is not an automatic step in a certain direction. It's a very complex future. Um, I have worked with circular economy concepts for quite some time. And sometimes I feel that we talk and we talk and we talk. The question is, when do we start to really walk? And the reason, of course, is that there are so many barriers. Regardless of which sector you look into, Today, reused materials, secondary materials, very often are more expensive than virgin materials. I often take as an example a brick. If you build a house, a reused brick is the double cost of a new brick. It's, it's no wonder that the construction industry will use virgin bricks. 
So the cost structure has to do with politics and it has to do with the market. The market is good at many things, but it's not good at factoring in environmental costs. And by the way, it's not very good at factoring in the interest of, of future generations. So we have to do something about the cost structure in the economy. And a very simple thing would be to remove taxes on labor, or at least lower them, and make it more expensive to use nature. Because there, there is where we have all the problems, externalities as they are being called by economists. So that's one thing. The other thing is, of course, design. Things are not designed well today. It's, it's difficult to reuse and recycle. A lot of composite materials, etc., etc. The third thing is, of course, that we subsidize the wrong things. Not only in the energy field, but in many fields. And then, of course, and that has been illustrated today, there are toxic materials involved. And then ma that makes, of course, recycling and reuse quite difficult. Um, and then I think we have to realize that there are also cultural issues. I was intrigued by uh, Edgar's uh, presentation. And I know about that study very well, where he says, well, you know, the most simple solution would be for people to, ha to live on less living space. Well, tell that to an average American who is working around the clock to buy a bigger house or have a bigger fridge. Uh, tell a youngster that you should keep your mobile phone another year or two years. It's not so easy behavioral issues, and I think we have to discuss them more and make people more aware. Um, and then, of course, business models are very often not geared to this. I think this example with moving from products to offering services is so elegant, is so smart. And I think it was Mats Pelbeck who said, if the responsibility rests with the producer, it's in their interest to produce something that lasts long and that can be easily repaired, updated, reused and recycled. But if you sell something, you have no responsibility. So I think the business models uh, are very, very important. So we must engage the politicians much, much more. And I, I see that happening in the EU, really. And it's quite promising. But we are part of a global market, so we have to do it all over the world. Tax reform, one simple thing would be to remove VAT on uh, reused materials. That would give a boost to that market. We have to have design requirements. I just read in the paper that the EU Commission now has come out with a proposal that electric char electronic, uh, chargers for electronic devices has to have a standard so that they can be used the same one for whatever equipment. That has been long in the making. How many times haven't we been almost crazy that we couldn't use the charger we had already in the hole because we, 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 we bought a new thing. But these are design requirements that are very, very important. And then I think finally public procurement, the public sector, between 15 and 20 percent of the economy should of course be used much more proactively to move the market in this direction to demand services rather than products, and to look for uh, secondary materials and secondary products. Well, I think those are my, my main comments, and as you, would, as you will see, they are very much focusing on the need for policymakers to help this transition to happening. Mm. And I would submit that too often we have conferences on the circular economy where these policy barriers are not really well understood. And I don't think, unless we remove these cost barriers, we will see good examples of circularity, but they will be, in, they will be scattered around. If we really move the whole economy to move in this direction, we need gener generic uh, proposals. And I think a tax reform and a design reform are the two most important ones. Thank you, Anders. I have one question to you uh, at the COP. How do you think the circular perspective will be brought in and what hopes do you at have? At the COP? Yes. Well, I think the most important thing will be for all member states 
to understand that the material use should be a priority in their climate policies. Mm -hmm. And that has not been the case because we have focused all our energy on energy consumption and on energy use. And now gradually this is changing, but it has to change everywhere. And we have to understand that material footprints is the same as carbon footprints. And that steel, cement, aluminum, plastic, textiles have particularly high footprints. And unless we do something about that, we are not going to, 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 uh, to meet the Paris targets. I'll give you an example. The International Resource Panel, we, we, have, we have made a study and we have looked at urban infrastructure, where you have a lot of steel, cement, etc. Our estimate, because of population growth and because of urbanization, is that we will, we will see a doubling of the urban infrastructure in the world in the next 30 years. Mm -hmm. We will build as much infrastructure in the urban areas as we have built during all history of man. If that happens with today's technologies and today's materials, only that will eat up the carbon budget. So this is, this is a must. So materials have to, have to be a priority in climate policy making. Mm -hmm. And I hope Glasgow will make that point very, very strongly. Hear, hear. Amen to that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anders Wickman. Thank you Thank very much.